Abscess theorem describes a method to calculate the volume of any solid of revolution. And what's a solid of revolution? It's any solid object that can be produced by rotating a plane figure about some axis. For example, a sphere is a solid of revolution because you can get a sphere by rotating a semicircle about this axis. A cylinder is also a solid of revolution because it's produced by a rotated rectangle. This thing is also a solid of revolution. So is this. And this. Okay, now you know what solids of revolution are. Let's calculate their volumes. We begin by considering a square of length L and a right triangle inside the square sharing two edges. The area of the square is L squared and the area of the contained triangle is half N squared. Now, consider a cylinder with height H and a base radius R and a cone contained within the cylinder. The volume of the cylinder is pi R squared H and the volume of the cone is one third pi R squared H. The ratio between their volumes is hence one third. Returning to the 2D case, the ratio between the areas of the square and the triangle is a half. Now what happens if we take another copy of the square and the triangle and place them next to each other? Then clearly the ratio between the blue areas of the triangles and the red areas of the squares has not changed. The ratio is still a half. Now let's take another copy and place it like this. And then another one, just like so. And then another one. And another one. And so on to infinity. No matter how many such copies we place, the ratio between the blue area and the red area doesn't change. It remains a half. With each iteration, our model of the triangle contained in the square is getting closer and closer to that of the cone contained in the cylinder. And at the limit at infinity, our iteration becomes akin to a rotation about this axis. Here, the cumulative areas of the squares sweep out the volume of the cylinder, and the cumulative areas of the triangles sweep out the volume of the cone. And since with each iteration, the ratio between the blue and the red areas doesn't change, the ratio at the limited infinity should also be a half. So, the ratio between the volume of the cone and the volume of the cylinder is a half. Wait, but that's not right. We just calculated the ratio between the volume of the cone and the volume of the cylinder to be one third. Now, you may argue that this formula here for the volume of cone assumes the ratio to be one third in the first place, and maybe that assumption is wrong. Maybe that ratio is indeed a half, and the formula should really look like this. While doing some quick integration for the volume of a cylinder and the volume of a cone, it tells us that the ratio is indeed one third. But there's no flaw in our argument here either, not at first glance at least. So, why does the math not make sense? To answer that, let us consider a simpler question. Imagine a blue ball and a red ball traveling in circular axis shown, but they both travel 90 degrees of the arc. Which of these balls has traveled more distance? Clearly the red one, right? Because it's farther away from the axis of rotation, that is to say, it's more radially distant. An object's more radially distant, more a greater distance upon rotation. Now imagine a stick with a part of it painted blue and another part painted red. The stick is now held at one end and rotated like this. Which part travels a greater distance, the red part or the blue part? Well, they're both part of the same stick, so they must have travelled the same distance, right? Because they're part of the same object. Well, that's obviously not true. The red part is more radially distant and hence travels a greater distance. This observation is the key to identifying the flaw in our previous argument. Points on the same object need not travel the same distance upon undergoing rotation. So looking back at our little experiment, the square has points that are further away from the axis than the points on the triangle. So on average, the points on the square move a further distance and hence sweep out more volume than the points on the triangle. That is why this ratio changes. We can see this if we consider this triangle inside the square instead of the other one. When this figure is rotated about the axis, the volume that this triangle sweeps out is 2 3rd pi r squared h. This triangle has the same area but sweeps out twice the volume because on average its points are more radially distant than those of the other triangle and when a point moves more distance it obviously sweeps out more volume. In fact, the volume can really just be thought of as the sum of the distances travelled by all the points in the figure and we will be using this fact to arrive at Pappus's theorem. I'm not going to provide any rigorous proof for this fact although it's just some trivial calculus. Hopefully, the animations on screen serve as enough proof. Oh, and our little experiment at the beginning. The visuals there played a part in the fallacy. It's because of the non-zero thickness of the squares. If we had used actual two-dimensional squares with zero thickness, we could never place them like this to form a complete cylinder. There would always be these little gaps throughout, because as we just saw, this end here needs to be wider than the center to fully fill up the space. Okay, so the volume of a solid of revolution is equal to the sum of the distances traveled by every single point in the figure. The volume is therefore equal to the average of the distances traveled times the total number of points. This is because the average of a set of elements is just the sum of the elements divided by the total number of elements. The total number of points is just the area of the figure. Now we just have to rewrite this term here. So let's take a little detour. Consider two points moving in a circular arc. The average distance travelled by these points is given by this expression. Now consider the average of these two points. The average of two or more points is just going to be a point midway between. What is the distance travelled by this point? It's again this expression here. You can check this for any number of points. The average of the distance travelled by all points is equal to the distance travelled by the average of all points. So rewriting our previous statement, the volume of a solid of revolution is equal to the distance travelled by the average of all points in the figure times the area of the figure. 
and this year the average of all points in the figure it is such an important and common entity in math that it has a name it's called the centroid so finally our statement reduces to the following the volume of a solid of revolution is equal to the area of the figure times the distance divided by its centroid and that's it that's the abscissa theorem